Please arise. The word of the Lord for our consideration this morning is from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So far the word of our Lord. We pray, Lord, let us see you and live. Amen. Dearly beloved, gathered at the foot of cross, mourning over sin, and looking to Jesus for rescue. Who do you see when you look in the mirror? Who do you see when you look at a picture? What do you see? Anastasia loves looking at both pictures and mirrors, but she's not very good at telling what it is she's seen. You'll hold her there and you'll say, Who is that? Where's Anastasia? Where's Daddy? And she just goes, Oh, oh, oh. And if you show her a picture, well, once we thought that she had figured it out, there was a picture of her, of her on the wall. And she says, Anastasia, or something close to that. But since then, we found her saying that to like every picture on the walls, no matter what it's a picture of. So I think she's a little confused. Obviously, as she gets older, she'll do a much better job of telling the difference between who's who in a mirror and who's who in a picture. And that's something that we need to be able to do as well when we look at God's Word. God's Word, after all, is both a mirror and a picture. One of the most, in fact, the most important aspect of understanding the Bible is distinguishing between law and gospel. When we look at any section of Scripture, we're looking at a mirror, which is showing us ourselves it shows us how far short we have come from fulfilling God's law. It's also a picture which shows us Christ. Because even the law, even that mirror of the law, is only there. God is showing us our sin so that he can show us our Savior. Law and gospel always come together, and you can't have one without the other. And understanding the difference between them is very important. We have a perfect example of that in our text today. A wonderful, simple and yet profound example of law and gospel given to us in story form. Of course, it's a true story, but the vivid picture that this story paints shows us clearly ourselves and our Savior. May God's Spirit be with us today that we may see rightly. The first picture that we come across is, is the setting. You know, any story, one of the first things you have to find out is the setting. You start reading a new book, and you are automatically, even if you don't realize it, you're automatically looking for clues as to the setting. Where is this taking place? When is this taking place? What's the context? What's happened before this? How do the events of the past bear on the events that are taking place in this book? And we get that right away in Numbers. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. They are in the desert over there in the Sinai Peninsula between the two fingers of the Red Sea. That's the area where they are. In the desert, in the wilderness, where there's no water naturally occurring and no food naturally occurring. So why are they in the wilderness? How long have they been there? Well, they've been there for 39 years. 39 years. And why are they there? Well, you'll recall that God had brought them up out of Egypt. He had delivered them. He sent the ten plagues to force Pharaoh to let them go. Then when Pharaoh came after them, he destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea and delivered them. He brought them to Mount Sinai where he made a covenant with them to be their God and for them to be his people. 
He gave them the Ten Commandments, and they said, yes, we'll keep those. Didn't take them long to break them. He brought them to the land of Canaan, and he promised to give it to them. But they had sent spies into the land of Canaan to kind of check out the land. And these spies came back, and ten of the spies said, well, guys, I don't know about this. There's some people living here already, and they're really strong. They're really tall. They're like giants. I mean, we're like grasshoppers to these guys. I don't think we can do this. Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies, said, what are you talking about? Who cares? God just destroyed Pharaoh's army. Haven't you been paying attention? He promised to give us this land. Let's go in and take it. But the people did not listen to Joshua and Caleb. They did not listen to the Lord. They listened to the ten foolish spies. And they said, oh, we can't do it. Let's turn around. Let's, let's leave. As punishment, God basically said, okay. He turned them around. And he said, you're going to go into the wilderness and you're going to be there for 40 years. And every single person who's 20 years of age or older, except Joshua and Caleb, every single other one, will not enter the promised land because they refuse to believe my word, and my promise, and my grace, and my power. That's why they're in the wilderness. That's what they're doing here. That's why they've been wandering around seemingly aimlessly for the last 39 years. And this is the 40th year. And that's why they have no food and no water. And that's why they walk around and the dust gets kicked up into their face, into their mouth, and into their nose. And that's why things are so difficult. And I think we can see ourselves in that situation. Because while we don't experience anything as physically difficult, generally, as what they were experiencing in that wilderness, this whole world is a wilderness where we are separated from the full beauty and, and glory of the presence of our God where there are difficulties, where there are dangers, where there are frustrations every day, hundreds of them getting kicked up into our face and our mouth and our nose. And like the children of Israel, we really have no one to blame for being in this wilderness but ourselves. Adam and Eve brought this corruption, as we sang about in the previous hymn, through their sin, and we're just as guilty of sin as they are. We're here in this wilderness we too are sinners. So, how do we react to all those difficulties, to all those frustrations? Well, what did Israel do? Verse 4 says, the people became impatient on the way. Literally, it says, their spirit grew short. And the image here, the same word is used for like cutting down crops, reaping a harvest. So imagine that you've let the grass in your lawn grow out pretty long, and you take the mower over it, and very suddenly, very quickly, what was long becomes short. Isn't that the way impatience works? Everything's going pretty well for you, and so you're fine. You're driving down the road, and you get stuck at a red light, and you're going to be late for something, and suddenly you, you lose it, and you start banging on the steering wheel, or you yell at somebody, or whatever it is. So easily we become impatient. So easily we become short, as the children of Israel did. And it's truly a, a, a remarkably terrible thing when you consider how patient God is. Here he was putting up with all of their garbage for the last 39 years. He's stuck in the car with them. And they are the ones that become impatient. We become impatient with God. And make no mistake, every time we become impatient about anything, we are becoming impatient with God. And that impatience is what leads to their grumbling. Verse 5, the people spoke against God, they're complaining, and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? This is truly a ironic, an ironic thing for them to say. Remember why they're in the wilderness still. God had not brought them up out of Egypt in order to kill them off in the wilderness. He brought them up out of Egypt to deliver them and to give them the land that he had promised. He brought them up out of Egypt as his special people from whom the Savior was going to come. Now, it is true that all those who are older than 20 years at the time of that rebellion were going to die in the wilderness, but that was their choice. That was their fault. It's because they hadn't wanted to go in the promised land. If they had trusted God, they'd be there right now, feasting on the fruits of the land. But instead, they're in the wilderness, and they will die. The rest of the people, and you've got to think by this time, most of the people are those who were told they would go into the land of Israel, those who were younger than 20. God had promised to bring them there. Their complaining, their impatience, 
is because they're not trusting God's word. They're blaming him for something that they did. It'd be like if you're playing basketball and, and there's five seconds left and your team's down by one and you're running down the court and the basket's wide open and there's nobody around you. All you got to do is throw, go throw in a layup and for some reason you stop, give the ball to the other team and then blame everybody else for losing. That's what the children of Israel's complaint here is like. It's ridiculous. And they go on. They say, there's no food, there's no water, and our soul lowless is worthless food. Notice, you can tell right away that they're exaggerating, in fact, lying. When they say there's no food, then they say our soul lowless is worthless food. It's not that there wasn't food. There was plenty of food. Because every day, God caused manna to come from heaven. Manna, which according to every account was delicious, tastes like honey. And he brought quail in the evening. So they had bread and meat every day. And then he gave them extra on Friday so they would have some for Saturday without gathering on the Sabbath. He gave them all the food they needed. It wasn't that they didn't have food. It's just that they got sick of the food that God gave them. It's like when you're at home and mom says, go get you know, leftovers from the refrigerator. So there's nothing to eat in there. And really there is. There's plenty to eat in the fridge, but you don't feel like eating that. And you ate that yesterday, and that's five days old, and you're like, eh, I don't want to risk that. They had plenty of food, and it was very good food. But they were complaining about what God had given. And water, too. There's no water naturally occurring where they were. But how many times had God provided water for them? And they still don't get it. God had literally just caused water to come flowing out of a rock, and it was the second time that he had done that. And they still don't learn just to pray to God. To trust that God is not going to let them starve out there in the wilderness. That's not what he goes to all this trouble. Destroying Pharaoh's army. Setting the ten plagues. Bringing them to Sinai. Doing all this. Keeping them alive for 39 years. Now you're just going to let them die? It doesn't make any sense. But that's what complaining is like. That's what grumbling is like. Every time that we complain, it's a symptom of a greater problem, that we aren't trusting God. And we do it just like the children of Israel do, don't we? Complain about the good things that God has given us. Become discontent about the things that we want, that we don't have. You know, we've got a phone, but it's a little bit too slow. Ah, stupid phone. Wish I had a new one. We grumble about the food that he has placed before us. We grumble about our job, but we wish this was better, we wish that was better, I wish I did something different, or I wish I didn't have to go every day, or I wish I didn't have to work as long, or I wish I got more money. Or we grumble even about our family. You know, oh, I wish I had more free time, or I wish that my kids were more like this, or that my spouse did that more often, or whatever it is. We grumble and complain about so many things all the time. And always it's because we're not trusting God we're not remembering that he has given us what he has given us out of love for us. That every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. We're not remembering that even the difficult things, even those frustrations every day, those are also sent to us for our good. Failing to trust him. So yes, I think we can see ourselves in that wilderness pretty easily. Right there with the children of Israel. Grumbling, complaining, failing to trust God. Can we see Jesus there? Yes, but in the reverse. See, Jesus, when he came here, came into the wilderness of this world in order to suffer in every way as we do. And it's interesting, as you look at Jesus' life, you'll often find similarities to things that happened to the children of Israel. When Jesus was very young, an angel came to his parents and told him, you've got to get out of here, you've got to go down to Egypt. Because Herod's trying to kill him. So they left and went down to Egypt. And a while later, they came back. And when they came back, Matthew writes, he says, This was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. But it's interesting, because when you look at that prophecy in Hosea, it's not just a prophecy. It refers back, and it refers forward. He's talking about the exodus of the 12 tribes from Egypt. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I have called my son. But it was a picture of Christ, because Christ himself was there with the children of Israel. He would be the physical descendant of some of those people. And everything that happened to them would, would happen to him. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Christ was led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. It's not a coincidence. The number 40 occurs in both situations. 
They were hungry. Jesus didn't eat for 40 days. They were tempted by the devil, the children of Israel, to distrust God and to complain against him because they didn't have food. What was Jesus' first temptation? Satan came and said, if you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And he's not challenging him if you're the son of God in the sense if you really have the power. No, what Satan's doing is he's making a direct assault on what God had just said to Jesus at his baptism. He said, you are my beloved son. You're my son. I love you. And Satan's saying, does he really? You're out here in the wilderness. He drove you out here. He wanted you to go out here. You haven't eaten in 40 days. You're really hungry. You're tired. God's not going to help you. Help yourself. But Jesus wouldn't. Because Jesus came to suffer in every way as we suffer. And when we are hungry, when we are tired, when we have difficulty, we can't just turn stones into bread. We trust God. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what Jesus did. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was tempted in the same way, in the same sort of situation as the children of Israel, and he passed perfectly. Perfectly obedient to his Father's will. And that perfection is done to cover up our grumbling and our complaining and the children of Israel's. That's done to give us his holy righteousness. So yes, we can see ourselves in that wilderness and that grumbling, and we can see Jesus too. What about the bite? The bite of the snakes. It's a very potent image. God sends among the children of Israel, as punishment for their, for their grumbling, these snakes. And uh, according to what I've read, these snakes are still in the area today. They're not, they don't like a specially made, miraculous kind of snake. And they're called fiery serpents for one of two or both reasons. They have bright red spots. But more importantly, their bite is both extremely deadly and extraordinarily painful. There's this burning pain. So here's the children of Israel out in the desert, and there's snakes everywhere. I mean, just picture it. The horrifying scene. I hate snakes. Most people do. And I think there's a reason for that. They're, they're terrifying. You know, they could jump out at you and bite you any second, and it hurts, and you die. And what are you going to do about it? More than that, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Satan first took the form of a snake. And ever since then, almost every culture around the world has had a snake as an image of evil and danger. There are the people writhing on the ground in pain, dying. Many of them did die, crying out to the Lord, repenting. We have sinned. It's a potent image. And it's one that we can see ourselves in. Because this is what sin does. Whenever we sin, we have been bitten by the snake, just like Adam and Eve were. Sin brings this deadly poison, for it causes pain in our lives, and it causes death. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And what he meant is that the law shows our sin. That's the strength of sin, because it shows how badly we have fallen short. The sting of death is sin, because sin means that we die, not just physically, but in three ways. There are three kinds of death. You learn this in confirmation. There's physical death which is a result of sin. We, our bodies die. There's spiritual death, which also is a result of sin. It means that we're separated from God. It means that we're separated from all of his grace and goodness and mercy and love because we have sinned and he can't be with us. And there's eternal death, which means that when we die, our souls and our bodies are separated from God forever in hell. It means he says to us, like he said to the children of Israel when they refused to go into the promised land, fine, have it your way. Go wander in the wilderness forever. This is the sting and the poison of sin. And every one of us has been bit. Every complaint, every grumble, every failure to trust God deserves this death. We can see ourselves in that desperate situation. But we can also see Christ. Because he was the one who was prophesied to come and be bitten for us. Genesis 3 15 brings us the first gospel message. It's referred to again in that hymn that we sang. God spoke to Satan in front of Adam and Eve, and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed, your descendants, and her seed. He shall crush your head, 
and you shall bruise his heel. And this is the image. You got, think you're, you're outside in your bare feet, and there's a rattlesnake. I don't know why there's a rattlesnake in your backyard in Wisconsin, but there is one. And you step on it, and it bites you. In the same moment, in the same action, you kill it, but it also bites you, which could kill you. On the cross, Jesus was bitten by Satan. His heel was bruised. He bore the bite of all the sins of a sinful, complaining, unbelieving, darkened world. That poison pulsed through his veins, and he was separated from God because of it. He died writhing in pain and agony. But through that, he crushed Satan's head, which brings us to the third picture. So beautiful and so simple is that pull. The children of Israel cried out for God to help them, to save them, and he did. He told Moses to make this bronze serpent and put it on the pole and raise it up so that everybody could see it. And all who looked at it would be saved. They wouldn't die. Well, God has done precisely the same thing for us. It's such a beautiful, close imagery, this type of Christ that we have in the bronze serpent. That's why Jesus uses it in our gospel reading. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The similarities there, the two similarities are so clear. The lifting up that God provided this way of salvation. The lifting up of the snake and the lifting up of Christ on the cross. And the second similarity is the looking and the believing. That's all that believing is. It's looking. It's God saying to us, look to Christ. And through his word, we do. His word which creates that faith. And looking to him on the cross, burying the bite of the serpent, crushing the serpent's head, we find what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, one verse before what I said before. O grave, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? He's mocking it. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The law, the, sorry, sin has no strength anymore because Christ fulfilled the law and has credited that perfect fulfillment to us. We are not bound to fulfill the law in order to earn anything from God. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians, by grace you are saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. The law is gone. It is fulfilled. We are not obligated to it. And that means that death has no sting. For when we die, we're not separated from God. But through Christ who rose, we will rise and we'll be all the closer with God. Death now becomes simply the way for God to bring us to our promised land. To take us out of the wilderness of this world and to bring us to him. And this whole picture is so beautiful because it brings us first to see ourselves so clearly, wandering in this wilderness, stung by sin, dying, desperate, in pain. But then it moves our eyes so that this last picture involves no looking at ourselves whatsoever. Here we see only Jesus. And it's important for us to remember that because Satan, he wants to, he wants to turn us around. He wants us to see ourselves here. So very often what he'll do is he'll pervert what faith is. He'll try to get us to think that faith is some work of ours. Something that we can take pride in. I'm better than that person because I believe. But faith isn't our work. Faith is just looking. Faith is God giving us things. It's totally his work. The same thing happened with this bronze serpent. People took what God had made to be good and they twisted it. They used it for something else. For 700 years later, it's the next time we hear about this, the same bronze serpent that Moses made, the people had made an idol of it. They were worshiping it. And King Hezekiah said, take that thing down, burn it. Because they had twisted it. Satan tries to get us to do the same thing with faith. But when we do that, when we have faith in our faith, we're not looking at Jesus. We're looking at ourselves looking. Instead, he says, Take your eyes away from yourself and look to the cross. 
The writer of the Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the sin which clings so closely to us like dust wandering through the wilderness. Lay it aside. Christ has laid it aside. He has forgiven your sins. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, looking at him raised up there on the cross for the forgiveness of all sins, bearing the bite of the serpent and giving us eternal life. I've been, at times, looking at paintings, a little confused by them. It's not always perfectly clear what the artist meant to portray. And in my opinion, unless it's my fault for not seeing it, usually that's a sign of poor art. A piece of art should show some message clearly. It might be deep, it might be profound, there might be more than you can understand, uh, glancing just once, but you should be able to look and you should be able to see what the artist was portraying. Well, of course, God is the master artist. And in this story from the Old Testament, a story that really happened, of course, through these events, through these actions, God beautifully and perfectly, simply and clearly portrays the most wonderful truth that there is. We were dead, bitten by sin, heading to an eternal grave. But Christ, lifted up on the cross, brings us to our heavenly, eternal promised land. Look to Jesus alone. Amen. Please arise. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.